right, welcome back everyone. So today we're going to just stop and do some recursive examples together on trees. That's really all I have today. We'll talk a little bit about how and when to use recursion, and we'll look again at the factorial example that we ended last class with on Friday, just as an example of um, a recursive algorithm that does not use a tree. Um, you know, the danger with doing this, like we're gonna do it, where we're gonna get a lot of practice on trees, which are, in many ways, a really nice fit for recursion, but I don't want you to conflate the two too closely. Recursion is a problem-solving strategy that we can use on a variety of different problems and with a variety of different data structures. On Wednesday, we'll look a little bit more at recursion on non-tree data structures just to sort of drive that point home. But today, the practice we're gonna get writing some recursive algorithms is going to be on trees. All right, so you guys had a nice uh, weekend, and let's get started. So when we're, you know, so again, for some of you, many of you, I hope this is new, the idea of using recursion to solve problems. Um, and it's one of those things, like I've warned, that takes some practice getting used to. It takes some time thinking about what's happening. And our goal today, you know, my goal today is to try to help as much as I can. You know, um, so please, as we go through, I don't have a huge amount to cover today. Uh, we're going to spend some time doing some examples together. Ask questions if you have them, right? Um, you know, this is something that can be a little weird, right, one, once we get started, right? Um, here are some strategies that we will follow and you will find helpful as you design recursive algorithms, okay? The first one is you have to, so remember, recursion as a problem-solving strategy solves problems, it's a family of algorithms, it's sort of a feature of algorithms that involves solving problems by trying to make the problem smaller. That's our first goal, is to figure out, is there a way to take a big problem, a more complicated problem, and make it simpler? Boil it down a little bit, break it into some smaller pieces. However, we have to know when to stop. We have to know the point at which we've reached a problem that's so small that we need to be able to solve it. When your recursive algorithm does it, this is sometimes known as the base case for building a recursive algorithm. A lot of times in your recursive function or in your recursive implementation of an algorithm, it's the first thing you do. You check to say, okay, M, is this a base case? Is this a place where I need to stop? Um, so that's the first thing, right? Um, the second one is the problem has to get smaller. So if the step that you are performing that tries to make the problem smaller actually doesn't produce smaller problems, then your recursive algorithm will never get to the point where it creates problems that are small enough to solve, and it'll never finish. It'll never get the, the job done. So on trees, every time we tear a tree into two pieces, every time we look at the right and left subtree of a node, what's critical about that is those trees are smaller than the tree that's rooted at the node that we're at. They have to be. They don't contain that node. And they also, you know, the right subtree doesn't contain all the nodes that are in the left subtree, and the left subtree doesn't contain all the nodes that are in the right subtree. So we know that we've essentially created two smaller problems. Right? That's why recursion, one of the reasons why recursion works so nicely on trees. When we talk about recursion on lists on Wednesday, We'll say, you know, the recursive problem makes the problem smaller because it produces, it starts um, again on a smaller list. So if I have a list with n elements and I reduce it to a problem of solving a list with n minus one elements, then I made the problem smaller. If I can continue that eventually, I'll get to a list with just one element that I can solve easily. And then a big part of designing good recursive algorithms is figuring out once I've solved two small problems, how do I combine the results together to help me solve the bigger problem? So the bigger problem is a function of the solution to these two smaller problems, but how exactly do I do that? How exactly do I put the results together? All right, so this is what we looked at last time. And again, this is a, a, a nice example of recursion for a couple of reasons. The first one is, it has nothing to do with data structures. This is a mathematical function that we can compute recursively. This is factorial, right? Uh, factorial of n is n times n minus one, times n minus two, times n minus three, um, in fact, it actually has sort of a recursive definition, right? The factorial of n is equal to the factorial of, of is equal to n times the factorial of n minus one. And we can continue defining that way until we get to one, the factorial of one is one, right? 
So here's a recursive, um, a recursive implementation of factorial. So the first thing I have is my base case. Remember, I have to make the problem smaller here. When we make the problem smaller, we're actually, what we mean is that we're computing the factorial of a smaller integer. We're not actually computing, uh, something on a smaller tree or on a smaller list. So when we mean smaller here, we actually mean smaller number, right? So this, uh, once I get to one, I know what the answer is. By definition, the factorial of one is one. Otherwise, I'm gonna make the problem smaller. So I'm gonna say, okay, I don't know how to compute the factorial of n, but I know from the definition that the factorial of n is n times the factorial of n minus one. And so now I've made the problem small, right? So here's my base case, right? The case where n is equal to one. You'll see that when we reach the base case, this is an important way to identify the base case. When we reach the base case, there's no recursive call. So you'll see, if you ask me what the factorial of one is, I know. I don't need to compute it based on the factorial of some other number, right? So there's no call to myself or any other function in here. There's just a definition, right? This is the definition of factorial. Factorial of one is equal to one. My recursive step, so where am I making the problem smaller? That's over here, factorial of n minus one. So if I don't know how to compute the factorial of n, I do know that by definition it's n times the factorial of n minus one, so now I've produced a smaller problem, right? I'm trying to compute the factorial of a smaller integer. And then finally, the combination of results here is the multiplication step, right? So I could, so for example, I could have a different function I don't know what, it, maybe there's a name for it, right? A different function that was the sum of all the numbers from n to one. And there I would replace my product symbol here with the sum. But the definition of factorial is that factorial of n is n times the factorial of n minus one, okay? So this meets all the criteria that we have set up for a recursive algorithm, the implementation of a recursive algorithm. Now remember, when I make the problem smaller, I have to actually reach the base case. So this is another common problem with recursive functions is they may think that they're making their problem smaller, but they also may do so in a way that never actually reaches the base case that they've set up. And last time at the end of class, what somebody pointed out here is that if I start this function on a negative number or zero, if I started on one, I'm good. If I started on two, it's gonna be two times the factorial of one. If I started on four, it's gonna be four times the factorial of three times the factorial of two, whatever, right? So this is gonna work. If I started at zero, my algorithm is gonna say, okay, well, I don't know what the factorial of zero is, but what you told me to do is compute the factorial of zero by saying it's zero times the factorial of negative one. This is also kind of dumb, right? Because as soon as I have a zero in my product, I should just stop. It doesn't matter how many other numbers I multiply in, that result's gonna be zero. But let's say I did negative one. Negative one, well, according to this, the factorial of negative one is negative one times the factorial of negative two. What's the factorial of negative two? It's negative two times the factorial of negative three. What's the factorial of negative three? It's negative three times the factorial of negative four. This will never finish. Just keep going and going and going, and eventually it's gonna run out of, run out of memory, right? So if we try to run this, um, let me see if this works. Let's put a, print statement in here to see what number we're trying to compute the factorial for. Um, and I don't think it's gonna let me do this. Nope. You can see that it tried really hard, right? It just, it kept going and going and going and it was, it was really trying, trying to do what I asked. Spent a lot of time, a lot of time, a lot of time. And eventually what will happen is that uh, the computer will be using so much memory to, comp to run this computation that Java will realize that something is wrong and your program will be killed. All right, so this is the stack overflow error. We'll come back and talk about this a little bit later in the class when we talk about errors and exceptions. But for now, you can just think about this as a sign that something went wrong, right? I was never able to solve the puzzle because I wasn't approaching one, right? So sometimes we refer to this as approaching the base case. My recursive algorithm in each step has to approach the base case. Here I have a base case, but my recursive step is in approaching it if I start it with a negative number. If I started with a positive number, I'm fine, right? Okay. So let me, uh, let me offer a caveat here. So this is one of those places 
you know, in your training as a computer scientist for, I think you actually get to um, exercise a fair amount of discretion and a fair amount of, um, you know, maybe some aesthetic judgment here. Let me, let me clarify one thing right now, because people, people, some people have weird ideas about this. There are no problems that you can solve with recursion that you cannot solve using an iterative approach. And there are also no problems that you can solve using iteration that you can't solve using a recursive approach. In fact, there are whole programming languages that don't have any loops in them at all. Okay? So, as far as problem solving strategies, they're completely complementary. If you pick a problem, I can find a recursive way to solve it. That recursive solution may be really stupid. It may not be a good recursive algorithm for that problem. But in most cases, I shouldn't say most, in all cases, you have the choice, right? You can produce an iterative solution to the problem, and you can produce a recursive solution to the problem. When you're starting out, we started out this semester looking at loops and looking at setting variables and things like that. We essentially trained you, and I think a lot of introductory computer science courses still do this. Um, you, a lot of you have been raised as iterative programmers. So when you, when you encounter recursion, one of two things I feel like tends to happen, both of which are bad, right? The first thing that happens is people get scared and they're like, I don't get that, I'm not gonna do that that way. Um, and they tend to shun recursive approaches and they won't use them, right? So that's bad in one way. The other thing that's bad is people are like, this is so cool and I can use it to impress all my friends who don't understand recursion and they start implementing everything using recursion even in places where it's not appropriate, okay? And of course, you know, the, the right place as in many things in life is in the middle ground, right? But that forces you to make judgment calls, right? Recursive solutions can be difficult to understand, I would argue, at times. Whenever you solve a problem as a computer scientist, your goal should always be to produce a clear, concise solution. And actually, we have some ways that we're gonna help you with that uh, that I'll talk about in a minute on some of the upcoming programming talks. Your goal is to write code that is clear and understandable not that is designed to make you look good or impress people, right? The people out there who will be really impressed by your code will be the ones that use it and have to mess with it a little bit and are like, this is really clear and very well documented and intelligible, right? That's what impresses people, not the fact that you use the particular programming technique, okay? If an iterative solution is more clear, use it, right? If a recursive solution is more clear, use that, all right? That's the simplest way to make this trade-off. It's simple in the sense that it's an easy principle, but I understand this is hard to apply. This is why people tend to either be sort of all or nothing about recursion. They're either just like, I wanna do all recursion all the time, or I'm never gonna use recursion even in a place where it would produce a solution that is much, much more clear, okay? Applying this discretion here is difficult, and it'll take some practice, and it'll take some experience. But please don't do this. This doesn't impress anybody. Don't use recursion just because it's like, oh man, my folks should call themselves so cool, you know, like, no one cares, right? Um, what they want is they wanna see you solve problems in a way that's clear and that can be integrated into other pieces of code and shared with others, okay? Here's the other thing you hear people say. They're like, well, the recursive implementation is shorter. I don't care, you know, like, have you guys ever seen these obfuscated code competitions out there? Has anyone ever seen these? So there are these competitions for like writing a piece of code that is completely ununderstandable, but does something useful, right? So actually, I remember someone once wrote an MP3 decoder. It's like one line. It goes on for like thousands of characters, right? Every variable is like one letter, you know? And you can't make heads or tails of anything that's happening, but it decodes MP3s. It really does work. Okay? Do not do this. Like, this is not your goal, right? Um, so the number of lines of code in your solution is not a measure of how good it is. Now, if you, if it takes you 200 lines to solve a problem that someone else solved in 20 lines, you have a problem, right? But if it takes you 30 lines and your 30 lines are more understandable than their 20 lines, you're the winner, okay? So code length is not something that we use in the programming community to evaluate our contributions. Clarity, okay? 
So here, let's come back to factorial. Here's an example of another way to skin this particular cat. This is an iterative approach to factorial. And when you think about the differences between these two techniques, I would really encourage you to put these side by side in your mind. The tree examples that we're doing right now are very, very hard to do iteratively. They can be done, require some data structures that you guys uh, haven't worked with on homework problems yet. Um, but factorial, it's like I can put up the iterative factorial and the recursive factorial, and we can just compare the two of them. This also computes factorial. It computes factorial using a loop. Remember loops? Kind of nice, right? So what do I do here? I start with the result, I set it to one, and then I go from two to whatever the number is that you wanted me to compute the factorial of, and I just keep multiplying my result by the next number that's part of the factorial. This is correct. It will work. The recursive solution is also correct. It will also work, right? These are indistinguishable from each other in terms of correctness. Which one do you prefer? Let me actually just get a show of hands here. How many people like this version better than the recursive version? Okay. How many people like the recursive version better than this version? Okay. Oh, I like that. Yeah, the, rec the one thing that's nice about the recursive one is it's more, it's closer to the mathematical definition of factorial, which is kind of nice, right? Um, so again, it really depends on the problem, right? Use whichever one you like, um, and, and don't worry too much more about the trade-off. Okay, any questions about this? We're about to do a little problem together, so let's clear up any questions about factorial or about when to and to not use recursion. Any questions about this? Okay, so let's apply our problem-solving strategy to this particular problem, okay? So we're gonna write a recursive function together in the next few minutes, and here's the goal. Given a tree, I wanna print out all the values stored in the leaf nodes, okay? I don't wanna print out values that are stored in any node that has children, but when I get down to the leaves of the tree, I want to print the values. Our tree nodes store values, whatever it's stored in the tree that ends up in the leaves, that's what I wanna print, okay? So, let's think about how to solve this problem recursively, okay? So what's the first thing we need to do? I mean, actually, we can start in a variety of different ways. Somebody give me a step here. So I want to print all the values in the leaf nodes of the tree. Remember, there's three things I need to do. Solve the smallest problem, make the problem smaller, and combine the results together. So what's one thing I need to do? Yeah. So what's, yeah, what's my base case? How do I know when to stop here? Yeah. Yeah, the question is, how do I find the leaves? So a leaf node in a tree is defined by the fact it has no children. In our binary trees, I store the children as the right reference and left reference. So if my right reference is null and my left reference is null, I've reached a leaf. At that point, what should I do? Print it, right? Okay. So my base case is I've reached a leaf, and I'm going to print the value of that, all right? Um, how do I make the problem smaller? So let's say I have, so if I haven't reached a leaf node, what do I need to do? What's that? Well, I need to make the problem smaller, right? So if I'm not a leaf node, then I must have either a right child or a left child. So I have a right subtree and a left subtree. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, hey, I don't know how to print, you know, I don't need to print myself because I'm not a leaf node. So what I'll do is I'll just consider my right subtree and my left subtree separately. I'll say, okay, I'm gonna restart my algorithm to print all the leaf nodes in my right subtree, and then I'll also restart it to print all the leaf nodes in my left subtree if I have one, right? And combining the results here is sort of done for us, right? So not every recursive algorithm needs to have this step. In this case, what's gonna combine the results for us is the output, right? That's where we're gonna see how things work. Okay, so let's do this together. Here's our starting point. This is our normal tree class. Um, I've set up a print leaves function for you guys to work on right here. So, so let's just go back here and let's kind of like do this based on our, on our algorithm, okay? So the base case here is going to be if, okay, so the first thing I need to do is I need to write this private wrapper function that's going to actually run on a node. 
So this is similar to what we did for size, and this is similar to what we're gonna do for our other functions. And my, my public print leaves function is just going to sort of reflect the function call into the private version that starts at the root, okay? So now let's do the following. So I'm gonna say, if my, if I've got no children, I'm, this is, this is the base case, right? then I'm gonna print the value at this node, all right? That's my base case, right? Can that not make that noise? Thanks. Um, all right, what else do I need to do? So I've got the base case in there. That's always a good place to start, all right? If you start writing your recursive algorithms without a base case, they'll tend to not stop, and you'll get those stack overflow errors that we were seeing on factorial just a minute ago. So it's, the base case is, is always a good place to start. Every recursive algorithm has a base case. And so getting that in place is good, okay? What else do I need to do here? Yeah. Yeah, so let's, let's well, let, let's get there. Let me come back to that. So, so I've got my base case. This is, uh, if I found a leaf, I'm gonna print the leaf. Um, and I'm also gonna return. Right, because I don't, I don't need to do anything else here. If I found a leaf node, there's no tree to go down. Oh, sorry. All right, so my recursive step here is to look at my right and left subtree. So how does that work here? This is kind of an interesting case too because this recursive function does not return a value. It just, the way it outputs things is by writing to the terminal. Okay, so how do I make the, so I've, I've handled the base case. But now let's say I get to line 58 because I'm not a leaf node, what do I need to do? Who can help me out here? Yeah. Yeah, so I need to call print leaves on current.left. That's my left subtree, so I'm considering my left subtree and my right subtree separate. So essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say if I'm a leaf node, I'm done, print myself. Otherwise, print all the leaf nodes in my right subtree and print all the leaf nodes in my left subtree, okay? Now, somebody pointed out a problem that I can have here, right, which is that, um, and this is similar to what we talked about when we looked at size. So let, let, let me do this uh, a little bit differently here first. So let's say if current.left is not equal to null. So if I have a left subtree, let's go into my left subtree. And I'll, I'll put the same thing down here. So if I have a right subtree, so what I'm trying to do is to make sure that print leaves is never called with a null reference. We don't have to do that, we can fix that in a minute, okay? So let's run this, so that, that, that looks like it worked, okay? Now I don't know for this particular tree what the leaf nodes are because I'm building the tree randomly. I know that one is definitely not a leaf node. Okay, so I should never see one in the output. And if I run this a few times, what you'll see is that I'll see four, I'll see three, sometimes I'll see two, because sometimes two ends up as a leaf node, um, but I never see one. Okay, so I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that this is correct. Now somebody suggested that we check for null, and there's a couple things that's gonna hap help us with. So the first problem is this, and this is the exactly same thing that happened to us when we worked on size, which is that when the tree is empty and the root node is null, then I get to line 55 and I start checking dot left of null, and because I have a null reference, these, uh, these two references blow up. So let's put in a check for null here. If, if I, what does it mean if current is null? What have I reached? I'm not at a leaf node. I'm not at a node in the tree, I've reached an, it's essentially an empty tree, right? If I somehow got to null, it means I walked off the side of the tree or maybe root was null, but the point is I've reached an empty tree. And when I've reached an empty tree, there is absolutely nothing I need to do. There are no leaf nodes in an empty tree. So there's nothing to print. Now when I try to print the empty leaf nodes in the empty tree, uh, this error is gonna go away. And the other thing I can do to make my function a little bit nicer is I can get rid of these checks. So now, because I'm handling null explicitly, um, 
put some values in this tree again. Five, seven. I can also, I don't have to worry about walking off the side of the tree. Right, because if I reach an empty tree, I say, that is returned. All right, questions about this. So here, let me just label this for you. Here's our base case. This is the recursive step. That's what's actually making the problem smaller. Here, there's no combining of results together. Again, like I said, that's happening on the output. The output display is what's combining the results. Um, question, yeah. No, so, so it's a great question. So the question is, do you always need a wrapper function? Um, sometimes. Um, it really, so you, you might wonder why are, why am I using this wrapper function, right? And the reason, so, so here's the explanation. I, I don't want, um, I want the root reference to be a private part of my class. So remember we talked about interfaces, we said the interface just defines the public part of the class. It defines what the other classes get to use. I don't want other classes poking around at the root node of my tree. They have no idea what's going on in there, they'll probably break it, right? If you made root public, somebody could set root to null and then your whole tree would just be gone. Okay, so I don't want people to know where the root is. I would like them to be able to print all the leaf nodes, that's why I wrote this handy function. But in order to, so essentially in order to expose this private information, right, what I do is I take, I provide a public method called print leaves that takes no arguments, and I just use that to start this private method that knows where the root is, okay? But there are also cases where you do kind of want a wrapper function, right? You'll, you'll find, like this is a technique, and, and you guys are gonna, most of the tree functions that we write will have wrapper functions. But as you go on in other classes, you'll find yourselves in places where you're just kind of like, I know I can use a recursive function here, but I'm not sure exactly how it should work. And sometimes ab adding a wrapper function helps. It's a great question. Okay, other questions about this, our next example here. We have another one of these that maybe we'll get to later. All right, so let me pause and talk about a, a new feature of the homework problems that starts today. So there is a homework problem out today. Uh, it wasn't posted at midnight, but it's up now. Um, and there, there are three recursion homework problems throughout the rest of the week, okay? And this is something that we haven't done before, so I just wanna talk a little bit about um, what this means. So, for the remainder of this week and as many, in as many places as we can throughout the rest of the semester, there is a small amount of credit on each programming problem, homework problems, not in the CBTS, only on the homework problems, it's like one point, for writing what we call perfect code. Now look, let's not get hung up on the word, right? Perfect has taken on new connotations recently as well. Um, this is, uh, we do not know if your code is perfect. I am not sitting there at night being like, yes, perfect, yes, perfect. Um, no one has looked at this. Your code can have many problems that are not detectable by us. But there are a couple things that we are going to look at, and we are gonna take this point off if your code is imperfect in either one of the following two ways, right? The goal here, by the way, is to help you write better code. So one of the here things I hear all the time from my, um, you know, colleagues in the department is, you know, all this auto grading that you guys do in these intro classes, the students don't know how to write better code because, you know, no one ever looks at it. I have to say, you know, you guys are like the now fourth gen or fifth generation of students that have used CheckStyle. The downstream instructors are so happy that we use CheckStyle. Okay, trust me, they're like. I used to get students that would write everything in like all unindented and stuff like that, and now they just know what to do, all right? So we're always looking for ways to help you guys improve the code that you write without, you know, having to read all of it because we don't really have time to do that. So this is in this vein, right? This is our goal. Our goal is to help you develop as uh, programmers and computer scientists by thinking through what you're doing. So there are two things that we can detect automatically and will take this point off for. The first one is if your solution contains code that is called dead. I will define what these terms mean in a minute. So if your solution contains what's called dead code, we will, you will lose this point. 
The other thing that will cause you to lose this point is if you have produced code that is overly complex. And I will explain what that means in a minute. That does not mean that it's too long. It's a different definition of complexity. And I, again, I'll present this. Okay, so what do we mean by this? Dead code. So what code in here is dead? So first of all, what we mean by dead code is the code that will never be reached, or code that is never reached in our tests. So here's how I know this code is imperfect. There is, there's a line of code here that I can take away. I can delete it. This is correct, but there's a line of code here that I can delete, and the function will run exactly the same. It'll still, this is correct, it'll still pass all the tests. This is a uh, size, which you guys did on Friday, right? What's the problem? Yeah. What's that? Oh, uh, so, so that's okay, that's, that's part of the problem, yeah. Yeah, okay, so here's the thing. If current is equal to null, I've returned zero. So if I get to line nine, I know current's not null. So I will never get into this else statement. This line of code, return zero, will never be executed. Right, so this is dead from our definition. This is the standard definition, by the way. This is what people mean with dead code. Yeah, did you have a question? Is there a question here? Okay, someone's just waving their arm, okay. All right, any questions about this? This is pretty, I, I think this is pretty intuitive. So if I can take your solution, and I can remove part of it, and it's still correct, it's not perfect, right? Okay, second piece of non-perfect code, right? So I'm never gonna get to this, this return zero, and we can detect that when we test it. All right, so again, I just wanna point out, these are both correct. Again, these are cases where this is correct code, and we're pushing you to a little bit of a higher bar. All right, so what's wrong with this? Who can explain, I mean, the slide says what's wrong with it, right? But who can explain what's wrong with this? Tell me why, what, how can I make this code better? Here's another way to think about it. You know, why, why is this code wrong? What can I do to improve it? Yeah. Yeah, so great, great point. So I'm already checking for null here. So I'm allowed to call size on null. I'm allowed to call the size of an empty tree. That's zero, I know what that is. So all of these lines here, line 10, line 12, and line 14 can all be replaced with just line 14, right? So I don't need to do all this checking of my right and left subtree and stuff like that. So this is, a, this is what we call overly complicated code. There are four paths through this code. So I can return here, I can return here, here, or here. The problem with overly complicated code is when somebody reads it, they have to think really hard about what's gonna happen, or they, they have to think harder. So in order to measure this, what we do is we essentially count the number of ways that our test suite can work their way through the code that you wrote. If that's a large, if that's more than a certain number, more than our solution, then we're gonna take off this point. Now, let me just uh, reassure you, our solution is not, like, tricky. Our solution doesn't, our solution is a solution that, that you know, is provided by me that's designed to be readable and correct and minimal but it's not like doing things that we wouldn't expect you to be able to do, okay? The solution, there are only two paths. So you imagine I remove that whole if statement that starts on line nine, I replace it with only line 14. Now when someone reads your code, they don't have to think, well, why would I get to line 12? Why would I get to line 10? Why would I get to line 14? The more paths there are through your code, the more someone who's reading it has to think about what would happen. And that thinking, that makes the code harder to understand. Okay, any questions about these new criteria? And again, we'll try to use these in as many places as possible uh, throughout the rest of the semester. Um, it's one point. You're welcome to ask for help with this one point. Yeah. No, there are no points for perfection in the CBTF, only on the homework one. Yeah. One, like I said, it's not very many points. You guys are welcome to ask for help on it. Our goal is to help you write better code, right? And I, and I think this does help, actually. Uh, we've had some really, really good conversations with students in the past, you know, around um, how to get this point, because it makes you think about what happens when the code is being executed, right? 
when you can identify dead code, when you can find places that you can reduce the number of conditionals that you need in order to express a solution, you're making your code better. Okay, any other questions about this? I just didn't want to spring this on you guys un undiscussed. All right, let's do another problem. So this one's fun, actually. This is, a, this is another expansion of our uh, abilities in thinking about recursion. All right, so our trees, and this is also fun because it's one of the first places we get to use the values in our trees, right? Up until this point, we've been only doing things that didn't really exploit the fact that these trees store values. So now let's do that, okay? So we're gonna write a recursive tree search function. The goal of this is to return true if a value is in a tree. If my tree contains a particular value, I wanna return true. If not, I'm gonna return false, okay? So how are we gonna do this? Okay, let's talk it through. So, base case. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's a great point. The empty tree is part of my base case. Does the empty tree contain a value? Doesn't matter what the value is, I don't even have to tell you. Does the empty tree contain any value? No, right? So I know I need a base case for the empty tree. The empty tree doesn't contain any value. So in that case, I'm just gonna return false, okay? What's another part of my base case, though? Well, actually, no, no, sorry. I th that, that is the entire base case, right? Yeah, so, um, so the, the entire base case here is really the empty tree. Ignore the slide, right? How do I make the problem smaller? All right, so the next step. All right, so if I reach an empty tree, I know that it doesn't contain the value. Otherwise, where do I need to look? Imagine I'm in a node. I'm actually at a real node. Where do I need to look for the value? There are three places. What's one of them? Yeah. Itself, my left subtree, my right subtree. So if I contain the value, or if the value is in my left subtree or right subtree, okay? So I've got three places to look. And, and remember, either all of those are smaller. I'm only one node. My right, I'm really trying to be correct about this. My left subtree has fewer nodes than the subtree rooted at me, and my right subtree has fewer nodes than the subtree rooted at me. So both of those are gonna lead me in a good direction, okay? Now here's what's interesting. How do I combine the results from these searches together? Okay, so this function returns a Boolean. So whenever you think about your recursive algorithms, you wanna think, what do I need to return? Because that can really give you some hints into how you combine the results. My size function returned an integer. And that was left subtree plus right subtree plus one. This function returns a Boolean value. Someone who I haven't picked on yet today in class. How do I combine the results? I've picked on you all day. How do I combine the results together? So, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So essentially I'm gonna use a logical or here to combine the results. And actually what I'm gonna do is even more clever. I'm gonna do if I have the value or if my left subtree has the value or if my right subtree has the value. Okay, cool. All right, so let's, let's, uh, let's do this bad boy. All right, so here you're also seeing the first case that we've done where the recursive function takes an argument. I need to know what to look for. Right? I'm taking an argument which is a reference to an object. I'm gonna use object equality, not reference equality here, so I'm gonna use dot equals, okay? Um, all right, so I'm not gonna worry about, let's not worry about null for now. We would have to worry about null, and we have to figure out how we're gonna handle that uh, in more detail if we were doing this for real, so let's just ignore that. So I'm gonna write a private function called search that takes a value and a current node to look where I'm starting my search. And for now, let's just return false. And here, now I'm gonna, this is my wrapper method approach. I'm gonna use my public method to start the search on the root of the tree. Okay. So now again, let's go back to my algorithm. So base case, right? So we agreed here 
that the base case was an empty tree. So if current is equal to null, then I'm going to return false. An empty tree has no values in it. So automatically, this is nicely going to handle the case where the tree doesn't have any content. If I haven't added any, added any nodes to the tree yet, the root is null, and this will return false right away. Okay. All right, so otherwise, I have this re recursive step I need to do. So let's see here. I'm going to return. So if, if the, if current's not null, then current has a value reference. And so I'm going to say current dot value dot equals value. So that's me. So I'm saying I have three places to look. The first one is me. Now check style is going to get angry. The second one is my right subtree, or my left subtree. I could start either way. Value current dot left. And the last place is my, the order of these, we, we might think that the order of these doesn't matter, but we're going to talk about that in a sec. Okay. So let's just admire this for a minute before we try to figure out if it actually works. All right, so my base case, Empty tree. Empty tree doesn't contain any nodes, return false. Otherwise, I look in the three places that I need to look. I look at me, look at my value. I know how to get to my value. I search my right subtree. In this case, sorry, I search my left subtree first or my right subtree. Okay? So let's see if this. Oh, man. Why is it angry? What is it angry about? Oh. It's over here. Okay. All right. Look at that. So that looks right if I look for four. Let's make sure it does the right thing if I look for something that's not in the tree. Looking for a couple of things. Let's make sure it finds the root. Get the values of the root. Let's make sure it finds a value that's pretty deep in the tree. I'm going to build a bigger tree now. Look for value eight. Okay. Cool. It's kind of fun. Let me ask you a question. So give you a little, th this, this will give me some sense if, that, you know, you guys are developing some intuition about how this works. So, and this also brings us back to short circuit evaluation, all sorts of fun stuff. All right. What changes about this algorithm if I do the following? Okay, so let's say that instead of looking at me first, I look at my left subtree first, and then I look at my right subtree, and then I say, what happens if I have the value, okay? What's different about this from what I just wrote? Let's make sure it works first. Does it work? Eh, it found eight. Is it gonna find one? It's gonna find one. Is it gonna find something that's not an integer? Yeah, that works too. Is it gonna find an integer that's not in the tree? That also works, okay. Well, what's, what's different about this? from a perspective of which is best? Maybe that's the best way to think about it. Which would you prefer? Which one's gonna be faster, more effective, more efficient? There is kind of a big difference here in terms of, yeah. Yeah, so let's think about how this, imagine I'm starting on the root, okay? So from time to time, the root node is actually gonna contain the value I'm looking for. If I check myself first, I'm done. I don't even have to look at my right subtree or my left subtree, and remember, short circuit evaluation in Java means that as soon as an or statement is true, we're done. So if I find that I contain the node, if I start at the root and I find that I contain the node, I don't search my right subtree and I don't search my left subtree. Blue, look, my left subtree. Let's do this. Let's print off as we're going. Print currently at, and then we'll do current plus value. So let's look, let's print off the value that we're actually searching. Okay, so here, and now let me search for something that's at the root. All right, so look what happened. Even though I was looking for a value that was contained in the root node, my algorithm explored the entire tree before telling me that, in fact, 
it had the node. So let's, let's go back to, you know, the other idea, which is to say, let's look in myself first, and then I'll search in these other places. So now, I only look at one node. So this is one of those things where if you think about it, and you convince yourself that you understand why there's a difference here, you will, this, this is a good step on the way to understanding recursion. Questions about this before I go on? Hey, this is a search algorithm. You guys just wrote a search algorithm. It's kind of cool, right? I mean, it's a simple one, but this is not in a different family than the search algorithms that you guys, the much more sophisticated ones you guys use all the time, right? Okay. So here's another question. So we've already looked at one little tweak that makes this algorithm more efficient. By stopping, allowing us to stop as soon as we find the value and not look in the rest of the tree. But can you guys think of another way to make this search more efficient? Yeah. What's that? So the suggestion is an in-order traversal, so I'm not sure that's actually really gonna help, because I still don't know where the value is. All right, so imagine the following. This is where we're gonna pick up on Wednesday. I'll leave you guys with this little nugget. Imagine that when I'm at a node, right now, if I go back and look at my code, I have to look for the node both in my left subtree and in my right subtree. I don't know whether or not the value would be in my left subtree or my right subtree, it could be anywhere. But what if when I built the tree, I built it a little bit differently? So that I knew, if I was at a particular node, I always knew whether or not the thing I was looking for would be in my right subtree or my left subtree. All right? So that is where we will pick up on Wednesday. All right, so, so there's a couple of announcements. My office hours this week will be Wednesday uh, at one o'clock. Um, there is a chapter of coders for next week. All the coders reading assignments are on the calendar now as part of the quiz, right? But I'll just give you a heads up for next week. It's chapter eight, chapter seven for today's quiz. Um, these are kind of, chapter seven's kind of an important chapter. Um, I have office hours on Wednesday. I hope you guys have fun. Tomorrow's lab is a good time. Um, I will see you guys on Wednesday.